Hi everyone, it's great to be with you and God willing it won't be long before we're together face to face and I'm looking forward to being with you again on Wednesdays on Zoom uh, starting on the 7th of June with our prayer and communion and then on the 16th for the church meeting and then from the 23rd of June uh, for our vision discovery evening. So I hope you're starting to pray about that and uh, come in expectation of what God's going to say to us through those times. Well, today is Pentecost, which is the birthday of the church. So happy birthday. And instead of diving right into the exciting bit, the usual Pentecost passage of the tongues of fire coming from heaven and all that sort of stuff, I asked for those verses to be read before and after Acts 2, just so we see a bit of context. So we see where that power comes from. Because we're so used to thinking of this as the Acts of the apostles and there are some great acts going on in there you read the book of acts and uh, the apostles do amazing things they they tread on snakes and and heal people and even raise people from the dead and survive shipwrecks but if we're not careful we kind of miss the point because it should be called the acts of god question the nobel prizes were named after the 19th century swedish chemist Alfred Nobel. Anyone know what he was famous for inventing? Well, if you said dynamite, you'd be right. And having invented the most explosive power known to man, Nobel thought long and hard about what word to use to name his invention. And he settled on the Greek word dunamis, dynamite. It just means power. And actually, it's the same word used in the New Testament to describe the Holy Spirit on a number of occasions, including here in Acts 1, verse 8. You will receive power, dunamis, dynamite, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Luke 24, 49, Jesus says, wait, and you will receive power, dynamite, from on high. Ephesians 1, 19 talks about the incomparably great power, dynamite, for us who believe. And Jesus is wanting to prepare his disciples for the fact that they're about to become very powerful once they receive the Holy Spirit. And like a parent of a teenager who's learning to drive, anyone been in that situation? Jesus wants them to know where the power comes from and how to use it. Because power is dangerous. Verse 4, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. We think about the book of Acts as being full of action and courage and heroism, and it is. But the first instruction in the whole book, wait, wait, wait for God. Else you're just going to do it in your own strength and it ain't going to work. Now, let's be honest. Some of us need to kick up the backside by the Holy Spirit. But others of us need to hear this word, wait, wait for God's timing we're always looking for the next thing the next move of God the next excitement and we maybe need to hear Jesus say wait because as I've learned the hard way so many times the right thing at the wrong time is still the wrong thing Jesus goes on verse 5 for John baptized with water but in a few days you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit That sounds a bit scary. Baptised in the Holy Spirit. Jesus never said that before. What does it mean? Well, baptism just means immersion. Being immersed in the Holy Spirit. And what the disciples are about to discover is that life in the Spirit is a whole life thing. It's not just about what we do on a Sunday. In fact, I dare to suggest that being filled with the Holy Spirit is very little to do with what happens on a Sunday. Because shock horror, the Holy Spirit didn't turn up at 10.30 on a Sunday morning. The Holy Spirit didn't even come in church. Because you can do Sunday Christianity if you're not careful without too much help from the Holy Spirit. As someone famously put it, in the early church, if the Holy Spirit left, 95% of what happened would have stopped. In the modern church, if the Holy Spirit left, 95% would carry on. Ouch. Moses encountered God while he was at work, tending his sheep. And God wants us to fill us with his Holy Spirit at home, at work, in our families, in every part of our lives. And so it figures that we don't need the church building to be opened to receive the Holy Spirit. Sorry if this is uh, kind of controversial or groundbreaking, 
but it figures. We also don't need an ordained minister to pray for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus had already gone to heaven by this point, by the time we get to Acts chapter 2. And as if to emphasise what a dramatic change it makes to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we suddenly get a little reminder back in Acts 1 that the disciples hadn't been filled yet. And we see the difference. We get to This is why I asked for Acts 1, then Acts 2, because you see the before and after pictures of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, for John baptised with water, but you're going to be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Dramatic pause. It's a big moment. Verse 6, the disciples replied, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> How Jesus doesn't bang their heads against a brick wall or each other, I don't know. Because they still don't get it. They're still dusting off their make Israel great again baseball caps. And to think that just over the page, Peter would expound the scriptures with such power and authority and understanding that 3,000 people get saved in one day. Such is the transformation before and after being filled with the Holy Spirit. These same men, before were cowering in a locked room, before Thomas saying, Lord, can I, can I put my finger in, in the hole in your side? And there's Peter saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus who? Never heard of him. After, after received the Holy Spirit, these same men, they never sat in a locked room again. Even when they were put in prison, they escaped, filled with his power, his dynamite do you need the power of the holy spirit do you need his dynamite in your life in your family in your work situation in your church or are we so used to doing things in our own strength that we hardly even notice the problem of course is that it's very easy to confuse what god says he will do and what he asks us to do the end of chapter 2 that we had read, it said the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They couldn't save a sausage. That was what God does. But what did they have to do? Well, the verse before the Lord added to their number daily says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Can you manage that? To devote yourself to the teaching of God's word, to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer and let God do the rest saving souls building his church worrying about tomorrow the problem of course is that we're often so insecure that we try to take responsibility for what God says he will do while neglecting what he's asked us to do we take on our shoulders the burden of responsibility for the salvation of our friends and family when Jesus said I have come to seek and save the lost. As church leaders, we, we take the burden for, for growing the church when Jesus says, I will build my church. And we see this time and time again in scripture. Luke 9, 13, there were 5,000 hungry men and their wives and their children. And Jesus says to his disciples, you're going to feed them. What? He does what only he can. He divides the loaves. The disciples do the rest. It's partnership. Exodus 4, God says to Moses, I'm going to rescue my people from Israel, from Egypt. And, and Moses says, fantastic, go God. And God says, no, 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 Moses, I'm sending you. Ah, that's a different story. But that's how it works. God says, I'm going to bring my love and hope and salvation to the, the community at Ferndown. And we say, fantastic, go God. I'll, I'll pray that they're receptive. I'll, I'll pray we get the right new minister to, to do the work. And God says, no, no, no. I'm sending you. Ah. God says, I'm going to bring reconciliation to your family. And we say, yes, thank you, Lord. It's been going on long enough. God says, I, I'm sending you to make the first move. Ah. So just think for a moment as we come to a close. Is there anything that God said he would do that you're trying to take responsibility for in your own strength? And at the same time, is there anything that he has asked you to do that you're neglecting? Just as you think about that, I want to close with a true story. And it's from Brother Yun. He wrote that book, The Heavenly Man. And he was a, a pastor in China and was put in prison for many years for preaching the gospel. And he writes about it in his book. And one of the most striking chapters, he says that in the prison, every prisoner was allocated a job to do. 
And the worst job was that right on the boundary of the fence of the prison was the cesspit and everything ended up in the cesspit. The waste from the kitchens, from the drains, yes, even from the toilets. And one prisoner had to climb down and dig out that cesspit every day. And Brother Yun says, I volunteered for that job every day. And he said, what they didn't know is I loved to do it. He said, because it was such a filthy job and because it was such a stinking place, no one would come near me. And I could pray out loud and I could sing hymns at the top of my voice. And I would sing, I come to the garden alone when the dew is still on the roses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. So the question I want to leave you with is, what would a spirit filled you look like? What would it mean for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It won't look like Brother Yun. It won't look like Peter, James and John. It won't look like your church leaders, but a spirit filled you fully surrendered to God's will. I wonder whether God might be stirring something in some of you today. A new calling, a new ministry, a new opportunity, and he wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit for the task. Don't be afraid, for he who calls will provide. And if you're thinking, oh, I'm long past doing new things for God, then just let me remind you what Peter says in his speech in Acts 2, quoting the prophet Joel. He says, your sons and daughters will prophesy, so there's no gender divide. Your young men will dream visions, your old men will see dreams. That's no age limit, lower or upper. Even on my servants, I will pour out my spirit. There's no status or class divide. Do you believe that means you? I'm here to tell you that means you. So let me pray. Why don't we just take a moment of quiet? And I pray the oldest prayer of the church. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us, your people. Lead us in your ways. Transform us in your power. Lord, we offer our lives to you like clay in the potter's hand. We're so sorry when we tried to do things in our own strength and we surrender to you. We cast our cares onto you. Show us, Lord, if there are things that we're trying to take responsibility for that you never asked us to. And show us if there are things that you have called us that we've been neglecting. And so in faith, Lord, we say, however, whenever, wherever you call, my answer in advance is yes. God bless you. See you next time.